Okay, this is a lecture for my eighth hour U.S. history class on the 22nd of March. Okay, well, Teddy Roosevelt uh, had a phenomenal rise to power. Um, in 1898, the year the Spanish American War was fought, Roosevelt uh, didn't, um, he didn't, um, uh, wasn't very well known throughout the country. Uh, just in New York, uh, and he was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and yet when the war was declared, he took, as they used to say, the bull by the horns, and he's the guy who ordered the initiation of hostilities. He ordered the U.S. Navy to attack the Philippines, Philippine Islands, excuse me, once the war was declared, okay? And then as soon as that happened, once the war started, he, you know all this, he resigned from uh, the uh, assistant secretary of the Navy, uh, assistant secretary of the Navy, went down, joined the Rough Riders, and his moment of glory came at San Juan Hill. The Rough Riders actually assisted the Buffalo soldiers in taking San Juan Hill. We've done all that, uh, and but but his life changed in 113 days. Here's my point: that the whole world changed in 113 days. This country certainly changed in 113 days, and Roosevelt's life changed in 113 days. Because nobody knew him before the Spanish, and at the end of the Spanish American War, he is a worldwide celebrity. Can you name me any worldwide celebrities today? Someone that's just known as a heroic figure all over the world. There are no worldwide celebrities today. Meghan Markle, she a celebrity? She known all of them. I didn't ask you to name me somebody you like. Just said, yeah. I'll know Elon Musk or something. Elon Musk? That, that sounds good to me. What about Prince Harry? Oh, yeah. Would he be known all over the world? Yeah. Okay. Was wife and his wife made him work? You know, weren't they paid weren't they paid three million dollars for a 45-minute interview? You know, sitting around talking about how badly they've been treated? Wow. Anyway. <clears throat> You know, I think somebody needs to take him and shoot you know, you know, get a grip, pal. But anyway, that's no topic for another day. Anyway, Roosevelt was like that after the Spanish-American War, okay? And so Roosevelt uh, he is elected in 1899 as the governor of New York, right? Governor of New York. Now, I may ask you on your test on Friday, Teddy Roosevelt was all of the following. An Army officer, <clears throat> a... Uh, member of the New York State Legislature, uh, a um, uh, <clears throat> governor or a senator. Which one of these was Teddy Roosevelt not? He never was a senator. So I would know the offices that he held. I would get that in my head. You don't have to necessarily write it down. But first, he's Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and then he's the governor of New York. And by the way, being the governor of New York is a pretty important thing in electoral politics. Why is New York so important? Today and in 1900, uh, in electoral in American electoral politics, why is New York so important? New York City. What? New York City. Well, what about New York City? <coughs> huh? Has a lot of people. Just New York City, or or the state of New York? State of New York. By the way, in 1900, the state of New York had the largest population of any state. And if the state of New York, which it did, had the largest population of any state, what else did it have that's important politically when you're going to elect the president of the United States? They had the most electoral votes. By the way, that's no longer true. New York's still important, but they're not the biggest state. Which is the biggest state? How many electoral votes? Yeah, 50 million people live it. How many electoral votes does California have? 56 electoral votes. How many do we have here in Oklahoma? We've got 4 million people, almost. How many do we have? We have seven. Add your representatives and your two senators. That's how you determine how many electoral votes a state has. Seven. You're going to see a lot of, you're going to see Donald Trump and Joe Biden passing through here a lot, making speeches. You're going to see them in California. Yeah. All the way, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, they had, last weekend, they had the state uh, wrestling championship, and Donald Trump came to that in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But 
That's pretty rare to see a presidential candidate here because we don't have a lot of electoral votes. New York did. And Teddy Roosevelt was the governor of New York. You know what that did? That jumped him from almost being a nobody to one of the most powerful men in America. He's the governor of the state that has the largest number of electoral votes. Okay? But, and also get this down about Teddy Roosevelt. He was a liberal, oh, that word we hate. He was a liberal progressive. He wanted things to change. He wanted to reform everything. And that brought him at odds, with odds, or not with odds, that brought, that placed him, I should say, at odds with this man. Get this man down. He's the boss of New York. Not just, can you name me any New York bosses we've talked about? <coughs> boss, who said that? Who said, excellent. Boss Tweed, remember him? But look, Boss Tweed just controlled New York City. This guy controlled the whole state of New York. If you walked in his office and sat down and convinced him to support you for president, he could sit and look at you across that desk and say, I can deliver all of New York's electoral votes for you. But you got to do the following three things on one time. And if you agree, you won the state of New York. That's how powerful he was. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much. In his name, hide him down. You know, this guy makes Boss Tweed look like a Cub Scout. His name was Tom Platt. What do you think Tom Platt's political philosophy was? What did I say Teddy Roosevelt's political philosophy is? He's a liberal progressive. What do you think about this guy? Is he a liberal progressive? Do you want to reform things? Do you want to change things? Why not? And why does he like the way things? <laughs> He's in charge. Yes. If you're in charge, you say, "Gee, we got to change things around here." No. So Thomas Platt, by the way, get this down. He's a conservative Republican, and Roosevelt's a liberal Republican, and they fight like Panthers from 1899 to 1900. Listen to me. You're doing great, Tom Platt. Wants to get rid of Roosevelt. He said, I gotta get Roosevelt out of this stinking state. He's a pain in my rear. I've gotta get rid of this guy. And so comes the election, get this down, of 1900. I want you to write this down about the, keep right on writing. You're doing excellent. I want you to write this. This is how Teddy Roosevelt became president. That's what I'm gonna ask you to address like this. So the more you can write, the better off you are. <clears throat> Very good. I see you right. Anyway. Then comes the election of 1900. Get this down. The Republicans were going to win this election. The Democrats don't have a chance. I guarantee you the Republicans are going to win. And who are the Republicans going to nominate for president in 1900? McKinley. Kenley. Get this down. William McKinley. You remember, listen, McKinley was first elected in 1896. What was going on in this country? By the way, what party is McKinley? What? He's a Republican. I just told you, Republican. <clears throat> 1896. What was going on in this country in 1896? Not, uh, not till 18. What? Uh, excellent. Advance to the head of the class, ma'am. A depression. And what did McKinley say? If you elect me, I'll get rid of the depression. What was his slogan? McKinley and the full dinner pail. People carried their lunch to work in the pail. Remember that? Remember all that? Elect me and you'll need your dinner pail again because you're going to have a job, my friend. Well, guess what? By 1900, the depression was over and people were working again. That's enough to get him elected. But something else happened between 1896 and 1900. The most important event of his presidency. The Spanish, look, write that down. Right in the middle of his presidency, the Spanish American War. And we won, didn't we? And it took 113 days, didn't it? And we didn't lose many men, did we? And what does this make McKinley? A successful, get this down, a successful war president. And there's nothing we like better than a successful war president. So for all those reasons, the Democrats are going to get smashed 
in this election. McKinley, everybody knows it. McKinley is going to be elected for a second term. Everybody with me? Okay. He's just got one little old problem. Did we talk about this? Is vice president died. Okay, we've done all this that I'm talking about now. Yeah. Huh. Well, why we can't? Uh, so his vice president is that where we stopped? His vice president died. Where did we stop yesterday? Well, I might have mentioned it. Okay. All right, I'll see. I'll just repeat it. Anyway, his vice president died, and they need a new vice presidential candidate, the Republicans do. We talked about what is meant by balancing the ticket, right? You want to nominate two people who appeal to a large group of voters. If you're the voting population of the United States, and I'm a political party, and we're going to nominate two candidates. We don't want just to appeal to people over in this front row. We want to appeal to all of you. McKinley is older. He's conservative. But you've got this brash, dynamic <coughs> guy that can't sit down, this reformer. McKinley's conservative. He thinks the same. But you've got this reformer that appeals to the young. And by the way, in 1900, American joined. We did this probably yesterday, too. America was growing younger by the minute because of what? Immigration. Spilling in. And we need somebody to appeal to the young. And they are going to nominate who? Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt. Write that down. It's vice president. The Republicans said, boy, this is great. Roosevelt. International hero. Most popular man in America. Yeah? All except one guy. Can we talk about that? One guy said, don't do it. Don't nominate Roosevelt, for God's sake. All the Republicans, they've uncorked the champagne. They've made their decision. We're going to nominate. And they said, this guy said, don't do it. And he's McKinley's best friend. In fact, he ran McKinley's campaign back in 1896. He's the guy that came up with the slogan, the full dinner paper. Who is it? Mark Hanna. Write that down. Mark Hanna. Or Hanna. H-A-N-N-A. Hanna. Mark Hanna said, listen to me, you Republicans. Don't you know if you nominate T Teddy Roosevelt, this young, radical, wild man, this crazy liberal, don't you know you will be placing him just one heartbeat away from what? The president. Right? President Biden. Who's his vice president? Who's Kamala our vice president? Harris. Huh? Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris? Was it Kamala or Kamala? I heard it oh. say Kamala. Kamala? Okay, Kamala Harris. One heartbeat. And by the way, that ought to be a concern because Joe Biden's an old man. There's no other way to put it. One heartbeat. And who's the president of the United States? One missed heartbeat, I should say. Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. And, and Mark Hanna said, don't you understand by nominating Roosevelt, and this is what he called Roosevelt, you're putting that damned cowboy one heartbeat away from the president. They laughed at Mark Hanna. Oh, McKinley's healthy. He'll serve out a second term, and then he'll retire, and Roosevelt will go away and we'll never hear from him again. Don't worry. And Hanna said, don't do it. But they did it anyway and got this down. And of course, who wins the election of the 1900s? McKinley. Yeah, who's the, and Roosevelt. Who's, who did the Democrats nominate that year in 1900? William Jennings Bryan. Okay, you don't have to, but second time, right? They elected him in 1896 to cross the gold speech. He's back in 1900. They'll nominate him again in 1908. He loses all three times. William Jennings Bryan. By the way, what was William Jennings, Jennings Bryan's big issue that he just would never let go of? The gold standard. What? The gold standard. What about the gold standard? Like he wanted to have silver. Silver. Yep. Silver. And long after the rest of the country had really forgotten about the silver issue, William Jennings Bryan just held on and held on. And he wrote that 
to his political grave. <coughs> so PR is now uh, the Vice President of the United States, and uh, William McKinley is now the President, uh, second term President of the United States. Then everything seems fine, okay? So uh, McKinley and TR, you know, the, uh, are sworn in in March of 1901. We elect presidents in November. We used to swear them in in March because that's when the ancient Roman New Year started. I told the class the other day, if you don't understand Roman history, you'll never understand this. And that this is the government you live under. It's got the Romans all over. But anyway, um, they're sworn in in March, the 4th, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. About six and a half months after, get this down, this is how Teddy Roosevelt became president. You're going to be writing this for me. I think you can do it. About six and a half months after they're sworn in, McKinley was invited to Buffalo, New York to make a speech. Presidents are often invited to places to make a speech. And so he goes up to Buffalo, New York to make this speech. <clears throat> Meanwhile, TR is in Washington. A lot of people say being vice president is the most boring job in the world. They elect you and just forget about you. But anyway, TR is up there in Washington. And so he thinks that the president's going to leave Washington. I'm going, I'm leaving too. So he goes out to the mountains in western New York. I don't know if you've ever been, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. There's a mountain range out there, part of the Appalachian Mountains called the Adirondack Mountains. And Roosevelt takes a train up to, I think, Albany, New York, and then he gets in a butt board wagon with two mules and his supplies. He's in his cowboy garb, and he just goes charging out to the west. And finally gets out there so far in the woods, there's no longer a trail. So he abandons the butt board, he gets off and hitches those mules. He's going to ride one mule. He puts all his supplies on the other. And he even goes deeper in the woods. And he's sitting out at this big lake with a roaring campfire. This is the vice president of the United States, not even any secret service man. This roaring campfire having the time of his life. Meanwhile, McKinley's in Buffalo making a speech. And McKinley made a speech. Just now, McKinley made a speech. And they had set up a tent next to the place where McKinley made the speech for a reception so people could come through and shake President McKinley's hand. And McKinley, by the way, is a really nice guy. Everybody liked him, you know. They might disagree with him politically, but he was he was just sort of known as being the national grandfather, uh, very a nice, nice, nice guy. And he was shaking hands there in that pavilion. And a little girl, beautiful little girl in a little white dress came um, walking up and McKinley stuck out his hand, okay, to shake hands with her. What a thrill for a little child to shake hands with the president. And that day, that day, by the way, McKinley was wearing a red carnation. And he thought after he shook hands with this little girl, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that mean a lot to her if I just put this red carnation on her dress? And so he took the carnation out, and he was pinning it on her dress. You all know what a pen knife is. You know, the pen knife is a little knife about that long. You tell you, a little short blade, you clean your finger. And while McKinley's pinning that on her dress, she had in her little pocket a little pen knife, and she took it out and stabbed him in the throat and cut his jugular vein, and he bled to death. No, that's not true. It depends on her. <laughs> he pins it on her, pats her on the head, and she goes on, and he looks up to shake the hand of the next person. And the next person was an anarchist. You know, the anarchists didn't believe in government and wanted to destroy all governments. And McKinley was a representative of the United States government. You don't have to write this guy's name down, but here it is. Leon Zalgaz. He was an immigrant, and he was a uh, he was a, a uh, anarchist. And there's a picture of what happened. Now that day, he had his hand. He had a small pistol in his right hand, and he had his hand bandaged. Okay, 
like this and a handkerchief. He had a handkerchief around him as if he was had a hurt hand, and he actually held out his left hand to McKinley. McKinley started to shake his hand. He's got that pistol down in there, and as McKinley's hand is coming forward, he raises it, and he got this down. He shot McKinley twice, right in the abdomen. And the bullet lodged back there in his intestines. Just down the street from where this happened, America's most famous inventor. And who was America's most famous inventor? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. Over a thousand inventions. He had created, invented a machine called a bullet detector. Because a lot of times people got shot. A lot of times people got shot and, uh, you know, they couldn't find the bullet. And this thing was on a wand that was about that big round and it was powered by electricity. And they would just lay you down and run it up and down your body. And I guess when it beat, that's where the bullet was. Uh, they tried that and the thing wouldn't work. So the doctors decided we're going to cut him open. And so they opened up the president uh, and they examined the wound. And the wound, had, the bullets had lodged between his stomach and his intestines. And it was just too delicate to go in there and do a lot of surgery. Today they could do microscopic surgery and McKinley would have lived. But they didn't. They just cleaned out the wound and sewed him back <coughs> up. Well, meanwhile, the Secret Service went up to the mountains, got this down where Roosevelt was, and they told him the president's been shot. <clears throat> and Roosevelt said, Is there any need for me to come down? And they said, No, no, don't worry, he's gonna live. And the doctors are said that he's going to live. He'll be fine. We're just letting you know. Within a week, get this down, that wound had become infected. <clears throat> and essentially, McKinley is going to die of gangrene. Do you know what gangrene is? Yeah, what is it? What? It's like an infection that eats away your skin. It rots you. Yeah. And by the way, what are talking about a painful way to die? For a week, he laid in the bed while his intestines were, were deteriorated. He literally destroyed his intestines inside his body. It's almost like leprosy. Okay. And McKinley died. I think he died on September 14, 1901. He'd only been president in his second term about six months. And when Mark Hanna. His best friend heard that the president was dead, and now that Teddy Roosevelt was by, was president of the United States, Anna, tears streaming down his face, slapped the side of his face, and he said to a room full of his associates, oh my God, now that damned cowboy is president of the United States. And Teddy Roosevelt was. Teddy Roosevelt was the president of the United States. And get this down, he will be the president of the, get this down, he'll be the president of the United States for the next seven and a half years. He is the youngest, get this, he is the youngest president ever to serve. The youngest president ever to serve. How old do you think he was? 27. How much? No, no, how old do you have to be to be president? What is the person? 31. Huh? 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. 31. Now, he's not the youngest ever elected, though. This is what I want you to understand. This is just trivia. You don't have to just listen. Who do you think the youngest? Because Roosevelt wasn't elected. He became president because McKinley got killed. Who do you think the youngest elected was? Who? Any guesses? Millard Fillmore? Huh? John F. Kennedy. Yes. By the way, Kennedy... Kennedy was 43 when he was elected, but the youngest man ever to sit in the White House as president was Teddy Roosevelt. Okay, and like I say, no one has, I think, enjoyed pre the presidency more than T.R. And by the way, the country gets this down. The country loved, for the most part, loved and enjoyed Teddy Roosevelt. You know, we elect people president, and you look at them four years or eight years later, they go in looking relatively young, 
until recently. And when they come out four years or eight years later, they look like they've been beaten to death. Roosevelt looked better leaving the presidency than he had when he went in. He loved it. He enjoyed it. Okay? And the country enjoyed it. I think he's the most popular president. Uh, maybe the only other one, the only other one that could um, match Roosevelt would be uh, Eisenhower. It's a, it's a contest between between those two. Um, everybody, get up and take a break real quick. Quick. Hot in here, to you all? Yes, it does to me. All right, have a seat. Sit up How many of you ever in your life had a teddy bear? Be honest. How many? One guy in the back. How many of you still have it? How many of you have it propped up on your bed in your bedroom and when you have a rough day at school, you go home and you snuggle up next to your teddy bear and you talk to it? One person. <laughs> Mr. Henley. What's your bear's name? Uh, Cooper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for all you aficionados of the teddy bear, you can thank Teddy Roosevelt for that. Now, this is just pure trivia, but it's too good a story to pass up. Um, by the way, Teddy Roosevelt hated the name Teddy. People who knew him well, when they were in private with him, they called him Theodore. If you called him Teddy, you were in trouble. He liked the name Theodore. And of course, after he becomes president, what was his name? What, what was his name after he becomes president? Teddy. No. Well, it's, it's Theodore Roosevelt, but what we know. Your name's Cooper Henley. If you become president someday, there's going to be a big name change. So what is your name going to be? President. Mr. President for the rest of your life. Okay. But anyway, Teddy Roosevelt hated it. But he's so popular, it's almost like he's almost like a cult. <coughs> His train would pull into a town and 10,000 people would be out there and he'd be waving and 10,000 people would be cheering, Teddy, Teddy. And he hated it, but like a good politician, he would... Smile and wave, okay? Well, Teddy, all right, he didn't like that. Well, uh, shortly after he became president, this is the story of Teddy Bear. Shortly after he became president, uh, there was a fire down in Mississippi and a forest fire. You know, presidents are the commander in chief, but sometimes they have to be the comforter in chief. Well, there's a hurricane, a tornado, some, an earthquake, a natural disaster. Presidents will show up and they'll walk around and they'll come to the people. Well, Roosevelt went down to Mississippi because a lot of homes had been lost in this forest fire. And he was inspecting the forest fire. And while he was walking around with the state officials, the governor of Mississippi and so forth, checking out the damage, one of his aides, you see that this is a cartoon from this incident I'm talking about, one of his aides found a little bear cub. I don't know what you call a female bear. I'll just call it a she bear. The mother was laying out there dead, been killed in the forest fire. And uh, the little cub was sniffing around it, okay, sniffing around it, didn't know that its mother was dead. And one of his aides comes up and sees this little cub, and he says, gee, the boss likes to shoot things. I'll take this teddy bear, and this not teddy bear, I'll take this bear, this little cub, and I'll tie it up to a tree, and I'll go get the boss, and the boss will want to shoot it. So this aide catches it, ties up the bear. He can't, this little helpless animal, and he, um, you know, goes to Roosevelt. He says, gee, I've got a, we found a bear. You might want Oh, great. He lied. Roosevelt uh, trots over there, and when he gets there, he sees this poor little animal tied to a tree. And, uh, you know, Roosevelt just, as they used to say, almost came unglued. I mean, he turns around on that aid, and he says, what's the matter? Do you think I would shoot this helpless animal? And he really dresses him down. Uh, and, of course, this incident made all the newspapers. And I've told you many times, you see the title there, drawing a line in Mississippi. Yes, I'm a hunter, but I'm not going to shoot a helpless animal. Roosevelt said. Uh, and anyway, uh, I've told you many times, never underestimate the ability of a, uh, an American to make a buck, okay? That's kind of what we're all about, making a buck. And as soon as, you know, this incident makes all the newspapers, people are talking about it all over the country, and a guy starts making teddy bears, okay? So that's where your teddy bear came from. And he named it after Roosevelt. Call it 
Roosevelt's such a popular figure. Called it a teddy bear. And of course, by 1904, by Christmas of 1904, there were um, over... Hey, there's a genius in the parking lot. I want to see this piece of junk. <laughs> too bad. Transmission will probably fall out later. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. They call it a teddy bear after Teddy Roosevelt. So if, when you go home today, what's your bear's name? Cooper. Yeah. And you can just stretch up next to Cooper. You know, Cooper, Teddy Roosevelt created you. And you and Cooper can sit there and think pleasant thoughts for about five minutes. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt. Okay, great. Okay. Anyway, well, that's all trivia. But Teddy Roosevelt uh, was about five foot eight. He's a little shorter than I am. He weighed over 200 pounds. Uh, he was barrel chested. Here's a great picture of Roosevelt. Well, that's not what I wanted. Right here. There he is. That's Roosevelt. And you can see, look at him standing next to that globe. He's not much taller than the globe. And the globes aren't that tall. They're just about like that. And so uh, uh, Roosevelt. Um, was like I say, a little over 200 pounds. He had he's one of the famous redheads of history. He had a mustache, a big walrus mustache. He had big square teeth. All the Roosevelt's had square teeth. When he talked to you, he <coughs> liked to get right up in your face, just like this. And the whole time he's talking to you, he's slapping his hands trying to make his point. I want you to know that people that talked to Roosevelt, when he got excited like that, they said the greatest fear we had of talking to the president was that we were afraid those big square teeth, you know, it seemed like every syllable he clenched, clenched, clenched those teeth together said we were afraid that his teeth were going to bite off the tip of our nose. Let me show you what I mean. Look at those teeth. Look at them. They're still some of my favorite pictures. Yeah. It's like you could eat an apple through a fence with those teeth. And all the, by the way, all the Roosevelt's, all the Roosevelt's had them. Okay. Of course, he couldn't see. We've talked about that. He was energetic. He was bold. He couldn't sit still. We've talked about that. If you came into your office and you had three empty chairs in a five minute, in a ten minute conversation, he would have sat in all three. One of his aides said this. One of the people that worked for him said this about Roosevelt. President Roosevelt believed that everything had to happen by sundown. Get this down. He's the first modern president. Roosevelt's the first modern president. And he was the first strong president that we had had since Lincoln. Roosevelt comes into office about 36 years after Lincoln was assassinated. You remember all, listen, you remember all those Gilded Age presidents we talked about? Those bearded non-entities? Who in the world remembers James A. Garfield or Chester A. Arthur or Grover Cleveland? Not very many people. They weren't very strong. Cleveland was the strongest of the lot. He wasn't really that strong. But Roosevelt is strong. Get this down. He believed, he was confident. Well, there's a difference now between being confident and arrogant. He was confident. He believed that he was just what the nation needed. And you know what? In 1900, he was probably right. And get this down. He knew, he, when I ask you who was Teddy Roosevelt, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He's forceful and he's dynamic. And here's what he wants to do. Got this down real quick before the bell rings. Here's what he wants to do. He wants to, his, his chief goal. He does a lot of things. We're going to talk all about Roosevelt. But his chief goal was to make America a global power. Get this down. Two things. He wants to make America a global power. He's not an isolationist. He wants to make America a global power. He wants America to dominate the globe. And he wants to make, get this down, the 20th century, the American century. This is what my notebook would look like right here. He wants to make the 20th century an American century. And to an extent, and to an extent, he succeeded. He believed in using, you hear this term, listen, you hear this term in our politics today. 
I'm going to go real quick here because I'm out of time. He believed in using the bully pulpit. I've learned in that over the years asking students, I asking modern day students, what is a pulpit? If that's an old fashioned word, what is a pulpit? You know what that is? Anybody know what a pulpit is? Somewhere you pray. What? Somewhere you pray. Well, you're in the ballpark. In church, what is a pulpit? That's where pulpits are. What? What? It's what you stand what? behind. What? It's what you stand behind for preaching. Yes, it's where you know if you go to church, or you, or you, you know, you go to the, your mosque. The imam at a, at a Muslim mosque stands up in front and addresses the congregation. That's the pulpit. People said this morning. I was explaining that to a group this morning, and they said, "Well, that's your pulpit." Well, it may be my pulpit, but my dad made this for me many years ago. This is more of a lecture. A lecture place to get. But a pulpit is usually associated with a church. Okay, everybody understand that. Well, here's what Teddy Roosevelt meant by that. Let this down. Here's what Teddy Roosevelt meant by that. He said, I'm going, you know, the old Gilded Age presidents waited for Congress to act. But Roosevelt said, I'm not going to wait for Congress to act. I'm going to, listen, I'm going to send laws to the Congress that I think the country needs. I'm going to send laws. I'm going to tell you need to pass this. And what if the Congress won't pass what I think the country needs? Send it again. What? Send it again. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Send it again. Well, what if he sends it again and they don't do it? Send it again. Rose, no, Roosevelt's not a patient man. I hope you've learned that. Well, he, you know, how's he going to do that? The president can't just say, I sent this bill to the Congress, they wouldn't pass it, so it's a law anyway. Can people have a petition for it? What? Can people have a petition for it? You're in the ballpark. He said, look, get this down. He said, I'm going to go over the heads of the Congress directly to who? States. What? States. Well, what in the states? The people. The people. Get this down. He said, I'm going to go to the people. And I'm going to convince the people to put pressure on the Congress, and the Congress will be forced to pass these laws. Now, in Roosevelt's day, to go directly to the people, you had to get on a train, and you had to stand on the back of it, and you had to make speech after speech day after day. And that's what Roosevelt did. Today, you know, President Biden, just think about this. President Biden proposed a thing, a bill last year, cost the country six or seven trillion dollars. He wants to rebuild every bridge, every highway, every seaport. He wants to, he said, hey, if we're going to compete against China, we got to be a modern country. And we haven't rebuilt our infrastructure, bridges, in, since, in, in 60 years. And he's right, we haven't. So he said, we need to rebuild that. And boy, the Congress looked at that and said, six trillion dollars, that's a lot of money. And they kind of balked. And at a press conference, they eventually passed it, but they, they kind of balked. But at a press conference, this was last year, they said to, 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 to Joe Biden, if the Congress won't pass that bill you sent up there, what are you going to do? And Biden, he was leaving the press conference, but somebody shouted out that, and he just stopped and turned, and he looked at those reporters, that room full of reporters, and he said, I'm going to use the bully pulpit. All the way, to, I'm going to the people, all the way back to Roosevelt, the bully pulpit. By the way, what's the bully pulpit today? So how's, how's the president going to communicate with the people today? Teddy Roosevelt had to get on a train and storm around the country. Huh? Phones, social media. Social media. I think there's even something. Donald Trump made this the bully pulpit. Twitter. Twitter. I'm going to tweet. I guess Facebook too. What am I leaving out? What am I? The news. Huh? The news. Well, yeah. You know, and, and he might go places and make speeches, but you know, he can communicate across this country, sitting right and never leave the Oval Office. Twitter, Snapchat. Um, that's how I'm going to uh, communicate the internet. But I'm going to go directly to the people, and that goes back to Teddy Roosevelt. And by the way. Uh, with Roosevelt, uh, it was uh, with Roosevelt. It was quite successful. Okay, with Roosevelt, it was quite successful. So he's going to revolutionize American politics. Get this down as well. Roosevelt, when he became president, quickly we're out of time. When Roosevelt became president, he thought the American people were getting soft. He said, "You know what? We're not as tough as Americans were a hundred years ago." And so what he said was, he said, "I'm going." <laughs> 
I'm going, one of the things he uses the bully pulpit for, he said, I'm going to, um, he said, I'm going to encourage the American people to engage in an active lifestyle. Write that down. And by the way, Roosevelt said, I'm not just going to tell them they ought to exercise and hike and climb mountains. You ride the bus, you leave. He said, I'm not just going to tell them to engage in the active lifestyle. You know what he's saying? Put on your Cheetos and get up off the couch. There weren't even Cheetos in those days. That would be the message today. He said, I'm not just going to tell them they ought to do it. He said, I'm going to lead by example. Get this out. I'm going to lead by example. So when we come back tomorrow, when we come back tomorrow, we will take up Teddy Roosevelt with the active lifestyle. So when we come back, say, you're going to tell us about the active lifestyle. Because if you just say the active lifestyle, I don't know if I'm just getting to it or I've already talked to you about it or what I need to do. So, got that? Thank you.